Hello and welcome. I'm just, I haven't done this in a, in a hot month. I'm making sure my mic is on and my camera. Hi everyone. Welcome to Focus On with the Alexander Valley Film Society. My name is Catherine Hecht and I am the executive director of the Alexander Valley Film Society and your host today. I think I might be a little out of focus. Come back to me, come back to me. It'll come and I think it'll catch up. Anyway, as we get started today, I just want to reach out. Thank you all for uh, joining us for the festival uh, in September. We took a month in October to clean up and rest and get ready for the rest of the year. We have a solid calendar of focus on events for you for the rest of November. And as we careen into the holidays, we have so many great discussions to look forward to and really incredible people who are joining us here in the studio to have those discussions with us. So uh, before we get started today, a little, a little housekeeping, let's see. So we are live across social media. We should be on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And uh, we encourage everybody to let us know where you're from. Uh, let us know where you're from, uh, type it up in the comments of social media and give us a holler. Today, we have two incredible people with us today. Um, we just, I actually just rewatched the film that we're going to talk about today, The Tuskegee Airmen. And we have the director, Robert Markowitz, and his lovely bride, Christine Barato, who are going to be in the studio with us today. So please give a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> nice to be here. So nice of you to join us. And for for those of us, uh, or those of you who are joining us, we have scheduled, rescheduled, re-rescheduled this particular interview. I think the first time we had it on the books, the fire set. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. The first. Yeah. First. The the first, first, first. Yeah. Right. The fire set. The first time. <laughs> Right. And then there was the threat the second time. That's right. And the threat the second time. Gosh. Well, thank you so much for making the time to be here. This is really exciting. It's lovely to be here. It's our pleasure. Yeah. And uh, our audience may not know this, uh, but Robert and Christine also happen to be local. They live in Healdsburg and share our lovely community with us. And how long have you been in Healdsburg? Uh, about eight years. Okay. And then before that, you were in LA full time, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And did you, you met in LA? No, no, we <laughs> met. That's another show. Uh, <laughs> uh, we met, we met a long time before. Uh, we we met, actually met in London Heathrow Airport on our way to communist Poland yeah. in 1980. Oh, <laughs> That make, is another show. I love it. <laughs> and that was to make another. That was to make the wall. Um, the, film. the film. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And you both. So you were in the airport and realized you were both heading to the same project. Um. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll go into that another time. We'll go yes. into that another time. Yeah. Um. But let's let's get right to it because this film. Uh. We we had an opportunity to chat a few minutes before going live and. Mm -hmm. I really mean it when I say this film holds up. I can't believe it to watch it a whole 20, 25 years later. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I mean, obviously I can see some of the dating with date, you know, how it's dated with technique or, or this mm -hmm. or that. And certainly the cast, I mean, they're all older now, mm -hmm. but it really holds up the story. And Robert, can we start there? Because you did tell me, um, you told me initially something about this now being in the lexicon of of war movies yeah it, it it sort of ascended uh i mean that helps explain it's uh still being aired i, I made it for hbo which is still airing it has been airing it pretty much every year for, for 25 years and it's i think it's uh it it, it is a film that obviously has um uh, a uh, social meaning especially to uh African Americans, and uh, but for others, um, are drawn to it by the fact that it is a World War II film, and World War II is still a very popular subject for movies uh, or people interested in. Them. So that's what 
gives it, I think, it, it's patina for people to continue to watch it. What a great word for a film. Yeah. Patina. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Yeah. So let's dig into that a little bit. So were you, I'm curious as to how this came to your desk in terms of projects. Why did you pick it? What was going on for you at the time? Can you give us a little background or color with that? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a rather mundane explanation in the sense uh, that I had nothing to do with the, uh, the inception of it. Uh, very quickly, uh, th that is an interesting story. The one person who was responsible for it uh, was a, uh, a very famous and one studio head, Frank Price, who ran Columbia Pictures. At the time, he was he was no longer there. He was on his own, and he had had that this project for years, and he couldn't get it made. Even when he was running the studio, he wouldn't take a chance on it. And the explanation as to why it couldn't be made as a feature film, because at that point, um, for distribution, uh, black, films about black subjects did, were, had no sales value uh, outside the United States or in Europe. Huh. So there was no back end on the film. So it wasn't until he went to HBO years later in 95 or 4, I guess, when he started and how it came to me was the fact that I had been making films for HBO and the more recent one I had made was also, uh, was called Afterburn and it was mm. also about uh, uh, the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more of an expose about a, a, a cover up of the F-16s which, in which pilots had died due to um, a failure of the manufacturer. Mm. And so they just felt it was, I guess, logical to come to me. I also had a background in having done a lot of movies about civil rights and racial issues and social issues. So the combination of those two things brought it to me. And uh, even back then, the question was obvious is uh, I, here I was a white director uh, about an iconic black subject. Uh, but that issue was sort of still pushed aside. Uh, I mean, they just came to me um, with it. But I recognized that I had to, um, the, the, first of all, there was the casting. And when I had made a film with Lawrence Fishburne before called Decoration Day with James Garner, and so I immediately got in touch with him personally and he came aboard right away and that got the whole thing started. And then we had this young cast. And so before, when we were in pre-production and before I even started the rehearsals, I realized that I didn't know enough about their experience. And mm -hmm. the very first thing I did was bring them together and we sat and talked. And I began with the question to them, if they would begin to share with me and um, and each other, uh, when the first time they had the realization that uh, about being black and what it meant in America, mm -hmm. and that was a rather um, stunning conversation because they were soon talking among each other. And I was just sitting there um, listening. And the discovery was that when Lawrence, who was the older one and, and, uh, and, and one other one, um, uh, was, was explaining to the younger black um, actors what it was like, you know, only 10 years before, hmm. we're in 95 now, um, about how they had to remain in their place and they, uh, it was risky to be outspoken or, or to complain. Uh, the younger actors didn't understand that. I mean, it was like Lawrence was, uh, Courtney Vance was the other older actor. And, and mm. uh, the younger actors didn't understand why they couldn't just speak up. So it was an education for them as well. So 
two things about that then mm -hmm. you had worked on so you had you had you had had projects then that were also military related mm -hmm. were you drawn to that as a subject matter no <laughs> it just have, it was just a random no, no i what i was was drawn to is i i was always drawn to, because i began in doc making documentaries I was always, and before that I was a journalist, so I was always uh, drawn to social and political issues mm -hmm. and subject matter. And uh, I, I mean, the film was a bit tim intimidating and had a very short schedule for, you know, it was 28 days for a film that size is really very, not, not very much time. And it had uh, a limited budget and the, uh, the way the contract was that you literally couldn't go one dollar over it was a huge penalty so I was a little bit nervous about it and um, but um, because of the subject matter I immediately said yes okay so the then that's the other thing I wanted to ask about the subject matter seems to really have spoken to you that you just and and I had forgotten this piece about you being a journalist uh, to start, correct? Yes. Is that where your interest in social is social and civil issues was born, or did that with chicken and egg on that? No, they were born in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> they they were born growing up, uh, you know, as a middle class person in Brooklyn. Uh huh. Um, with parents who were very, um, they were middle class parents. They hadn't gone to college, but they were really um, socially involved and, and interested. And so that obviously was in my DNA. And so I, you know, and I started out wanting to be a writer and then went to journalism, but that, that area stayed with me. And I just pursued those opportunities wherever I could find them. What part of Brooklyn, by the way? In uh, Flatbush. Brooklyn. Flatbush. I yeah. lived in Jackson Heights, Queens for 20 wow. years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not Flatbush, but uh, yeah, not oh, I, I, I love New York, obviously. Uh, it was home for a really long time. And I, I can certainly relate to that. There's a lot There's a lot of stripping away and getting down to the itty gritty, the right. nitty gritty uh, in New York. Right. Um, okay, so then... You're you're on this. You're drawn. You're drawn to the story. You've got these guys. Which, by the way, uh, for anybody who has yet to revisit this film, I mean, we're talking Lawrence Fishburne, Andre Brower, mm -hmm. Courtney Vance, Malcolm Jamal Warner. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think the Cosby Show had wrapped by that time, right? Oh, yeah, and, that was long past. Yeah, yeah. So he was now doing. He was getting into his ser more serious roles. Right. Yeah. Um, Alan Payne, John Lithgow. By the way, who I, I had forgotten this turn. He does that race that racist white yeah. southerner so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because of the subject matter and because uh, it was HBO, which uh, really was out front of everybody now. Mm -hmm. You know, weeks before everything changed. Yep. Um, so these people came aboard pretty quickly. And then did you, one thing I, I did not ask you in advance, where did you shoot this? Because it was two major locations. In Arkansas. It was all shot in Arkansas. All in Arkansas. Wow. Yeah. How yeah. about that? All in one location. Yeah. So, so then let's, you're making this film, mm -hmm. which at the time you're making it, did you have any idea that you were adding to such an important, adding such an important um, element or installation into this lexicon of military film and and um, uh, an African-American film. Um, did you have any sense of that at the time? Yeah, I did. I mean, I didn't know how successful it would be or whether I would be able to pull it off, uh, but I certainly knew the context of it. I, I, Part of my background in documentary, when I was with, it was all with CBS News, uh, I I did a weekly documentary uh, in, called Eye on New York, and and this was in the late 60s and early 70s. 
and it was at the height of of the civil rights unrest. And 1968 is the only year that is parallel to 2020 in terms of the division that the country was in, especially over racial issues. And I was doing one of those a week, a half hour, one of those a week. And most of them that really had to do with racial stories because that was on the front burner every single day. Families were divided and all of that. So you shot many of them in Harlem, didn't you? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. them in Harlem. So I was really familiar with the material and the subject matter. Not not the Tuskegee. That was all new to me. But I knew it was an important piece of their history. And I felt a real responsibility. And I will say just creatively, um, one of the things that I was very conscious of, I wanted to, to make authentic, but as many as heroic moments as I could within that story. I didn't want to build a film in which you had to wait for the heroic moment to come at the very end, the triumph. I felt that, on a, that they were doing things, those pilots were doing heroic things on a day-to-day -day basis, and they were facing racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I tried to um, structure it in a way where there would be those kind of high points on it. You know, I really appreciate that. And I feel like the, you know, the opening shots with uh, Lawrence Fishburne's character saying goodbye to his family. Yes. I mean, you just instilled that sense of honor and discipline and service from yes. the very beginning. That, and that was heroic. Yeah, you know, I, I really, I guess, uh, probably to a fault, if, if you match it against, you know, the realism that we do today, but I really wanted, I wanted to, to all the characters to have dignity, because that was something they never got on films, very mm -hmm. rare. And, um, and I could do it legitimately and authentic, because I, it was all true, uh, the stories were, and so... Um, that's how I proceeded. And then uh, we we also talked about briefly just the, the the parallels. I mean, already you've said so much about 1968, and then here you're drawn to the story because of your background and the social and civil issues that are in the story, and being mm -hmm. open enough to learn about other people's experience to properly tell the story. And then here we are in 2020, and going back and looking at this movie again, we have characters saying things. Um, as salient and poignant right. as, as we're, we're hearing again today. I mean, well, really in the last few months. Yeah, it's actually sad because we're, we're, the, the, the parallels is that not enough things have changed. And so that's why those points resonate so clearly um, for the lack of change. I mean, we have made progress, but those things are still there. Yeah, and I think also, Robert, the thing that really struck me as the characters were finding their um, their directive, mm -hmm. like, this is about us, but it's not about us. Right. There was a real clarity of purpose, mm -hmm. and it just kind of, everything else fell to the wayside. And I don't want to be... Um, a, you know, a head in the sand optimist, but I, I certainly related to that. And I think that I think there's um, there's part of that that's true today as well about doing what's right because it's right. Mm -hmm. And the rest will, we have to keep working on the rest, but that will hopefully mm -hmm. fall in line at some point. Right. Anyway, um, so looking back on this, um, we've, you know, we've looked at, the moments that you were making the film and, and, and having any kind of vision about what it would actually mean in terms of cinematic history or, you know, filmmaking history. Looking back now with your 25 years of experience, life experience, creative experience, is there something that you might have want to change about the work or anything that, that, you feel particularly proud of now things that pop up for you even even now with the film well there's, there are there are always things that you want to change i mean <laughs> it was i think it was george lucas who said that uh 
as far as directors are concerned, uh, no film is ever finished. They're all finally abandoned. <laughs> um, yeah. And, Especially uh, for $8 million. Dollars. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no, I am sure there are things uh, that I wouldn't bore you with that, that I could see that it would change. Uh, you mentioned the opening, and I'm actually really proud of that um, and um, because there's no dialogue mm -hmm. in that first two or three minutes that sets up the whole story. And, um, and there, there is a mixture of that piece of filmmaking is a mixture of, of, of feature filmmaking, but it's also a feat uh, this document, my documentary background is in there and that voiceover of Roosevelt talking about the starting of the war and the, and the camera's panning over the newspaper. And uh, so I was able in a very concise way to pull the audience into that particular period yeah. before we even got to Lawrence. And, <laughs> and um, so, you know, this, I just want to say something on behalf of craft, you know, for those filmmakers who are out there watching, uh, there's nothing like it is to, to the ability to understand um, structure and, and uh, the, the craft of filmmaking to be able to tell your story. I mean, that is a film that is really made with a lot of craft. And I mean, not all the films I made before were, but that one was. I love that. Thank you so much for, for sneaking that in because mm -hmm. I am tickled to have had that experience as an audience member and to hear you articulate it. Mm -hmm. So that's really fun. Um, just I'll just throw in that yeah. Rob reminded me, we looked at the film again uh, just recently that in preparing for it, he, he studied World War II films. Mm -hmm. And um, part, you know, partly because of the, just the technology difference at that time, but, but also the fact that they were more romantic films. They were right. films about right. heroes. And I think that at looking at it again, it, it, it's, it's in contrast to some of the more cynical uh, undertones of, of today's filmmaking. Mm. Great point. And also how um, that is a total tie-in to the dignity that Robert was talking about, like having our African-American characters and um, actors actually have that experience on screen where they are full flesh and blood, mm -hmm. having, you know, a full range of human experience and emotions, mm -hmm. and that we actually get a window into that. That's right. so important. So switching gears just a little bit because Christine, I'm so glad you piped up. Um, we, one thing that, uh, that the three of us got to talk about a little bit that I'd love to hear more for our audience today is the two of you, we can go into the origin story another time, but the two of you working together. So can you tell us a little bit about that and about um, how that works both at home and at work and, Navigating all of that? Sure. Um, I'll just say that when when we met, we, I was working sort of in the production area, uh, not in the creative area, but I was always drawn to the creative area and watched Robert working and um, was impressed with all of the, um, the emotional aspects of filmmaking. And we worked together uh, for a number of years trying to get films off the ground, trying to get things made where I was a pro pro where I was working as a producer. And one day he turned to me and he said, "You know, I don't think you're a producer. I think you're a writer." <laughs> and uh, it, it happened that I was in bed with a with a back injury, and I had done some writing on a, a story that we were working on together to pitch to try and get money to hire a writer. And I thought, well. I've read so many writers, I'm, I'm just gonna write a few pages of it. And he read it and he said, you need to work on this. And then he mentored me for the next six years. And I wrote a lot of pages and he would read them and say, this is better, but go back and do it again. Uh, so when I finally uh, did break into um, uh, the professional ranks of writers, it was largely due to um, Robert's encouragement and his um, guidance and um, uh, 
And I had been on the set with him for so many years, sort of as his wife or as a producer, that the first day I walked on the set as the writer of a film that he was directing, he turned and looked at me like, um, what are you doing here? <laughs> And it was my first realization that there is this built-in inevitable friction between the person who has the first round of imagining the story from a blank on a blank page where mm -hmm. I hear the voices. I have to hear and see and imagine everything in my head. Right. Um, but then when it goes to the director, uh, he has to execute it with real life actors who may not be anything like the characters that I've dreamed of. I think for the audience, if you, if you think about a favorite book that you've read and then you see the film and it doesn't match up with the pictures that were in your head, well, that's what happens when a, when a, when a script goes to a director. And then first of all, it's the director's job to have the director's vision Right. But more importantly, the director is working with um, variables that often he or she doesn't have control over. Weather, casting, uh, oftentimes one of the films that we worked on together that I wrote and Robert directed, uh, the real life, it was a real life story, in fact, about a, a family here in Bodega, in uh, Sonoma County, Bodega Bay, the Green family. Oh. Nicholas Green was the little boy who was, um, shot and killed in, in Italy and they gave his organs. And I wrote that script mm -hmm. and I was very taken with the real people, the, the Greens, um, Reg and Maggie Green. But when it came to casting Re uh, Maggie, Robert was, um, was off, you know, the, the, the thing that it took to get the movie made was to, ca to cast a star who was quite different from her. Right. And that's when I learned, I finally learned on that film that he didn't pull rabbits out of hats. He had to deal with real actors. He had to deal with maybe losing the light or losing a location. And then you're um, uh, limited by the, the all of the vicissitudes of what happens on filmmaking. So anyway, uh, there were times when uh, he would come home with films, with, with, with things that he shot, and it wasn't anything like what I thought it was gonna look like. <laughs> Finally, after a year, after several, I think it was the fourth film that we made together, we finally worked out the way to do it. And that was that I would write him little notes on paper that he could take with him to the set. And it would sort of describe my intention, but I wasn't standing there breathing down his neck or making the actors nervous by having the writer raise her eyebrows. <laughs> and it, are, these, are those things that you've been able to pass on to other to other creative people for their own education? Um, no, not I don't think so. Um, actually, this is the first time we've actually talked about this. <laughs> in, uh, no, not, no, I don't mean between ourselves. It's the first time we've ever talked about it in, in publicly an, in, an, in an interview. <laughs> it, is, it, I, I, it is an interesting subject, and and the journey that we took, which I mean, was a wonderful journey. We, we made. We got to make films in a lot of different places in the world, and um, and it was um, uh, a a creative journey in which we both finally uh, found a means of communication that worked for both of us, and hopefully made the the films better. And, um, I mean, you are you in the end uh, to me uh, the. Uh, the most important factor in the filmmaking is finally the actors and and their ability to stretch a piece of material or not meet it is is just critical and um so there are timing mean, chris was I mean, chris is a wonderful writer and still is and and she would write very in scenes which were very subtle um and uh, they were not right in your face. They were authentic and they were good pieces of writing. Uh, but they took a special kind of actor who could do it, who understood uh, what to do. And, and there weren't a lot of them that could do it. You know? let, me, let me just say that the, for, for, for people who haven't written or read screenplays, the writer is limited to, to action and dialogue. 
you can't talk about the internal life of the character on the page. It's action and dialogue. And um, so it's the, what I tried to do when I was writing uh, dialogue, for example, was to leave room for the actor to bring the internal life of the character. But sometimes that was, as Robert said, it was subtle and they wouldn't get the intention. And that was the part that we were able to work out is that I would, I would write, if I knew what he was shooting that day, then I would write, well, the, my intention in this, in this particular scene is blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that he w had that front and center in his mind as he was working with the, the actors. And that, that made it possible for both of us to communicate better and come up, you know, and, and the end result showed both of our input, I think, in a yeah. clearer way than, for example, when I worked, when I wrote screenplays for other directors and I didn't have that same kind of access to them and yeah. they were particularly interested in what my intention was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, and so I know that we used Tuskegee, the T Tuskegee Airmen to kind of kick off the conversation, but I am curious about that. If, if both of you have, um, you know, a moment, a character or a part of a film um, that you worked on that ended up transcending what you felt you had brought to the table? Was there someone who inhabited it in such a way that it illuminated for you even further than what you had imagined? Well, that's happened to me many times. I'm, I'd have to stop and get to just review uh, my head uh, the specificity of it. I mean, you know, I, I was very lucky. I, I work with a lot of young actors and actually that really, as I look back on it, uh, I, that was my preference. But finally, uh, I reached a place where in, where in order to get these films made, you had to have stars. And sometimes, sometimes they did what you asked. They <laughs> Beyond, um, I, you know, I think of actors like uh, Jonathan Price, where I made the miniseries David, uh, the, the uh, David from the Bible, uh, and he would do that pretty regularly. Um, uh, but there, there were times when um, it would go the other way, and there is one other thing that should be said about working with with stars. So things are completely different today, by the way, but in my experience, um, stars have uh, an investment in their own career history. Mm. And uh, there are places they don't want to go uh, for fear that they, it's, it's going to upset their audiences and they're going to lose that aspect of it. I don't think that's true. Um but they do carry that. So there were there were many times where I would try to get an actor who had the tools and the talent to get to that place, but refused to. Wow. Because, uh, I mean, an example would be not specific to any actor, but an actor who is asked to play uh, an unlikable moment, mm -hmm. right? A selfish moment. And without, as an actor, commenting on it, letting the, you know, actors have a way of letting the audience know, even when they're doing something negative, that that's not really them. Yeah. It destroys the scene. And uh, so there's a lot of that as well that happens. Now, there are, you know, to your question, as often uh, as the other case um, uh, instance wh where they do transform, where, where you're, you're the way you know it as a director is when you forget to say cut, right? When you, <laughs> right. Yeah, when, yeah. When you're, when you're so caught up in it. I mean, you just lose time and place. And Christine, while you were listening, did you think of anything on your end? Well, yes, unfortunately, the, it's in the film that um, it's not easy to get a hold of these days because it's tied up in a legal thing, but that's the, the Nicholas's gift, the, the green film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I wrote, I had to, uh, in order to make the, 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 the story emotionally satisfying, I wrote both the green story, but also the stories of the, of the people who in Italy, the children and so forth, who got the, the organs. 
And um, as it turned out, most of the characters were based on real characters, but the boy who got the heart did not want to be part of this. And so I made up this family. And um, when we got to Italy to shoot the film, the, I remember that the, the actor and actress who played the Italian parents of the child who would, would have died had it not been for Nicholas's, Nicholas's gift, the gift of his heart. Wait, wait, um, can I just put, Robert, well, what are you doing over there? What's that? What is Robert doing over there? I'm sorry, I, I, I was looking for something. <laughs> He's he was, drifted away, you know. No, I, I was looking for the name of, of somebody. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I just hear the scratching. Okay. So please, I'm sorry, Christine, continue. Well, I, I was just to some, just to finish that off, the, the, the two Italian actors who played those parts were so real, even mm. though it was a fictitious character, fictitious characters that I had written. And because they were Italians and I, you know, I didn't, hadn't lived in Italy and um, I did the best I could to give them full characters, but it was, you know, it was by nature sort of a sketchy uh, uh, um, description of the characters. They came and filled those parts out yeah. in a way that just even thinking about it brings tears to my eyes. Um, they were just so full of passion and um and emotion that they and they were they were uh it was like it had happened to them it was really like it had happened to them uh, so that would be my example that comes to mind right away of a, a time when the actors brought something that i could that i couldn't have written myself i was just looking for their names actually that's what I was oh doing. how funny so you knew that part of the story yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because um, I don't mean to project my stuff all over the two of you, but it does seem like the two of you have had um, a, a really satisfying experience of, of the creative process and that it has fed you. And I, I that just really comes across. And so... Um, I, and I, I'm mindful of the time. I know, uh, of course, I, I had a feeling we'd go, <laughs> we'd go way past. But um, can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing now to stay creative and it singularly or with one another? Well, I'm um, I'm writing a novel, um, uh, which what I started out to be as a novelist and got sidetracked and actually became a director almost by accident. But um, so I finally got back to where I started and um, I'm, and I've been actually working on it for a number of years. And uh, fortunately uh, I am very close to the end of it. I, I'm just a couple of chapters away. And um, congratulations. <laughs> and you know, it, it, it it's a novel that embraces a lot of my own experiences as a filmmaker, uh, but uh, it's a novel that um, began many years ago when I, while I was still making films, and I began to become aware of the fact that we were losing the anchor of reality in our culture, in our country. I could just see it coming. Oh, and, and, and so um, the arrival of where we are today is not a surprise to me. It's mm. but it's a, not a surprise. And so thematically, that's what the novel is about. It's, the main character has lost track of reality. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and it gets more and more confused every day and while still trying to hold on to the center. Wow. Wow. How prescient. Yeah. And I'm, I'm currently working on, um, my mother uh, passed away with Alzheimer's and was the repository of many, many years of, um, of actually generations of stories passed down in our family. We were a family of storytellers. And so I decided it, as she began to lose her memory that I wanted to write down those stories. And I, I wrote many of them then, but now I'm bringing it up to into a... <laughs> into a second a couple of generations later uh, so that my children and grandchildren and so forth will know these stories because otherwise the stories we lose the stories with the people 
Yeah. Oh, how fabulous. Good for you. Oh, well, this has just been an absolute delight. I think we should probably do it again. <laughs> Okay, we're here. <laughs> but of course, uh, the way we are, the luck we've had with scheduling, I'll probably see you in 2021. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you both so much for being here. You know, before, before we head out, I do want to ask you, because so much of what we do is about um, encouraging young people to tell their own stories and to, to not only tell their stories, but to become media literate, to learn how to use media tools. Um, and is there something that just top of your head that you might like to pass on to a young person today in this particular moment, um, about being creative or about telling your story, um, top of your head, anything come to mind? Well, um, I, you know, I, I was thinking about that and, um, Briefly, you know, during all of my time, uh, especially growing up, uh, even before I was a filmmaker, but even when I started, uh, there was a f mystery about making films, and it was something you aspired to. What is interesting and, and very positive today, uh, there isn't any more of a mystery for young people to making films than there is about reading, because... Um, you know, as soon as someone can read or has an iPhone, they know how to make films. It's it's the, 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 to learn the basic physical elements of craft is not very difficult. But the the great difficulty today is to compete with the life that we're living. As I was thinking about this, is preparing. It occurred to me that. What film or story or miniseries can approach the fact that at this very moment while we're sitting here, 333 million Americans are holding their breath, right, to find out how this story ends or at least the next chapter of it. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to compete with that dramatically. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that the more personal stories you can tell, the better, because personal stories end up being universal stories. And I would just add, I would just add uh, for young people uh, thinking about writing or wanting to write, the, you, uh, a famous writer once said that anybody who has a pencil in their hand and a piece of paper in front of them is a writer. We all have our own, each one of us has a story that's unique right. to ourselves. Nobody else can tell your story but you. And whether it's a story about your own life or a story that you make up in your imagination or a story that you heard about and you want to write, uh, you will bring to it something that nobody else does. And just start writing and keep writing and you will gradually um, get better and better. And if nothing else, it will feel so good to put this, put these words on paper and be able to read them back again. So don't wait. <laughs> you're, never oh, too, don't wait. you're never too young to start writing. I, I actually took both of those things down that you, you both said at, and shared them on our social media. Mm -hmm. This has been such a lovely conversation and mm -hmm. I do hope you'll come back. I'm so glad that you live close and, and that we can keep tabs on you and, um, Thank you for sharing your time. It's been a real honor and pleasure. Well, well thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank, thank it's you, been, Catherine. It's been fun to be here with you. Yes. Yay, good. All right. So we'll say goodbye to you all. And uh, for the rest of our guests who are with us today, not in the studio, but hopefully across the airwaves, stay safe, stay sane, and stay connected. Be sure to vote on Tuesday if you haven't done so already. And remember, we're all in this together. Bye-bye.